types of radon, what it is, what are the hazards associated with it, what, uh, what the position of uh, the U.S. EPA is, what the position of, uh, of some authorities around the country, such as myself, how, how we feel about radon, so that you can make an informed decision of your own as to what risks you're willing to take. We all take risks of all sorts every day. When we, we took a very serious risk when we got in the car and drove over here today. But it's very difficult for us to make choices when we don't have the information. And that's what we're hoping to do today, is to, is to raise the level of awareness on this. Mike, can you give me the, uh, the slides here? Now, of the average radiation dose in the country that, uh, that people get any year is roughly, uh, of that, 55% of the total radiation dose received comes from radon. More than half comes from radon gas. Let's turn the light off. We can see. Okay, having difficulty seeing the slides. Sorry, could you speak just a little bit louder? Speak a little bit louder as well? Okay, I haven't had that request in a long time, so. <laughs> Okay, and 55% uh, of it coming from radon. Um, about 8% comes because we live in a universe that has radioactivity in it. And uh, we have another 8% that comes because we live on a radioactive planet. And internal, around 11% of the radiation dose our body receives actually comes from, uh, you know, the elements that we're made up of ourselves because we're, you know, we're made essentially out of dust and that's what uh, the, uh, the, the planet being radioactive, that's, that's part of what we get. Around 4% we'll get in a lifetime from nuclear medicine. And that's the population as a whole. Some of us won't receive uh, much dose from that. Uh, some will receive quite a bit of dose. And from medical x-rays, around 11%. And consumer products have some in them. There's some things we don't think of being radioactive. Those little lanterns on a Coleman uh, stove, the little lanterns that fit on those, yeah, those are made out of th thorium that the, it has, gives off some uh, radioactive uh, materials. And then there's this other slice, a little bit of 1%, and that's where we get uh, all the nuclear uh, fuel cycle, the, the nuclear power plants and, and all these other things fall into this 1% this of the radiation that we receive. And this is, of course, all forms of radiation that we come into contact with. And so radon becomes significant because that's most of the radiation that we're exposed to. Surveys from across the country that EPA has done in the past, um, the white states haven't participated, and all the other states have data from them. And Ohio is in the red category on the, on the chart here. And that's greater than 20% of the homes have levels of radon above four picocuries per liter, which is EPA's action level. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that in, in, in just a moment. But you can see it's in, it's in the highest group of states with greater than 20% of the homes. And this survey was done several years ago. And we have some of that data on a slide at the, at the end of the presentation where we can talk about the, uh, the results from that individually. But this is how radon works. It starts out as uranium, and uranium decays into radium. And both of these, uranium and radium, are metals. In the soil, they're just part of the dirt, part of the rock that's out there. Nothing special about them. They're radioactive, but they aren't a hazard to us. They aren't danger. They have very long half-lives. In other words, they don't decay very often. And so they sit there. Unless somebody moves them or picks them up, they're just going to stay put. But when radium, a uh, solid metal in the soil, decays into radon, radon is a gas. And it's one of those non-reactive gases over with neon on the periodic chart of the, of the elements. In other words, it doesn't react with other things very well at all. And so it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get tied up. It's free to move through the soil with the air and the gases that move through the soil. And that's how it can enter the home is just by moving on the currents of air that come the soil that might enter the home. And we, and we usually think of our homes as being very fairly tight, particularly if we've done weatherization on a home. 
because we've, we've done a lot to tighten things up. But usually, if we think about it, when we weatherized the home, we just tightened things up above ground so that cold air outside didn't come in. And we haven't paid much attention to how much air came in from the soil. As a matter of fact, we might even have encouraged that a little bit because, you know, that air is about 55 degrees year-round in the soil, which isn't bad. It's certainly less expensive to heat it from 55 up to a desired temperature than it is from zero outside, and it helps you cool in the summer. So we haven't really considered it to, to be that bad of a thing if the, if the air comes in from the soil. But in the soil, we can find levels of radon that can be quite high. And it's the second key leading cause of lung cancer. Really now it's third because we have smoking itself being the number one cause and we have the passive smoke being number two. And the smoking itself is way ahead the leader. It's the, the number one. And back in the pack we have passive smoke, the people who are around smokers and radon being pretty much neck and neck there as the, uh, as the causes of lung cancer. And as of the health effects from lung cancer, I'm, I'm sorry, the health effects from radon, they are lung cancer only. And you know, it won't make your dog get cranky if he stays in, you know, in the basement too long or, or he, won't, he won't have difficulty walking. It's just, it's just lung cancer. And this is how it, it, it pretty much works. We've got the radon in the air and with with radon, it's sort of like the weather. You know, it's not the heat, it's the humidity that we hear all the time. Well, with radon, it's not really the radon either. It's sort of the decay products. Because radon's that gas that we would breathe in and breathe out. You know, if it doesn't decay while we're, while we're holding our breath, then we don't have to worry about it. But when it decays, it decays into these little decay products that are in the air, little dust particles that are radioactive. And our lungs are very good at cleaning the dust out of the air. That's part of the function. It cleans the dust out so when the oxygen gets down to the lower part of the lungs where it, it, gets, you know, it gets changed over into the bloodstream that it's pure, as pure as it can be. And so these decay products that are radioactive get deposited on the lung wall. And that's how they get in such close proximity to the lung. Now with with radon, the type, of, the type of radiation that we're talking about is something a little bit different than we might think of. Uh, when we think of gamma radiation, that's some of the stuff that comes from outer space and travels through a, a, a very long distance before it gets slowed down. And uh, beta radiation, which is similar to, to x-rays, which we know that they go through most of the tissue. It gets slowed down by, by, by dense things like bones. That's why we can take x-rays of the body and see bones and, and more dense tissue, distinguish it that way. But, but most of it goes through if it's not impeded. What we're talking about with radon is alpha radiation, and it doesn't travel very far. It'll only travel about this far in air. So it has to be directly against you very close to you to be a problem. If we had a source of alpha radiation right there and we wanted to protect ourselves from it, we could just take a step back and we would be safe. But having it in the air and the small particles in the air, we can't take a step back from it. it, it, it it's around us. So we need to uh, try and create an environment where we don't have many of these in the air. And that's what we'll be talking about doing. Radon is estimated to cause thousands of, uh, of deaths in the U.S. each year, but let's sort of put it in perspective. Here we've got drunk driving causing uh, about 20,000 deaths per year. Here we've got radon estimated at somewhere between uh, uh, 10 and 14,000 deaths per year. Then we've got drownings down here, fires, and this little tiny slice over there's airline crashes. Just to give us sort of a perspective of what, you know, what radon's re responsible for compared to other risks that we take all the time, like just getting in the car and, you know, we take a chance of running into a drunk driver or every time we go swimming. So if we, if we compare the, the radon threat, let's use pesticides here being one of the examples. Here we've got pesticide applications and 
we see how much more more of a risk radon is than, than the pesticide issues issues are. Radon and smoking. One of the things that is uh, interesting or unusual about radon is that it magnifies the effect of smoking. In other words, if you have a risk, uh, you have some risk of getting lung cancer from the amount that you smoke. If you're also exposed to high levels of radon, that sort of multiplies that level by about 10, the risk of getting lung cancer. Okay, so it, it, it not only ca can cause lung cancer on its own, but it can certainly help smoking along as well. And since smoking is so much greater cause of lung cancer that if you smoke and you're exposed to radon, the best way to reduce your exposure to you know, lung cancer, your risk of lung cancer, would be to quit smoking first. Then with the money you saved on the cigarettes, you could take care of the radon and you wouldn't be, you know, wouldn't lose any money on the deal at all that way. So, uh, but these are the risks to someone who smokes, to a former smoker, and person who never smoked. Just complain the radon and no radon. If they're just exposed to four picocuries per liter, which is the EPA's action guideline. Uh, many associations, organizations have identified, uh, many people have endorsed it. Radon is, be, ha, is causing lung cancer. The American Lung Association, the American Medical Association, which actually helped prepare this slideshow, uh, American Cancer Society, American Public Health Association, who made it possible with American Medical Association and EPA to, to bring these programs around the country, and the Environmental Protection Agency and the Surgeon General all have issued you know, warnings on this. And so, but we'll take a moment and step back and see what they, what they took a look at. When we want to consider something to be a health risk, we try to look at four criteria, make sure it meets four tests before we, we say that it's a problem. We like to have a model. We try and understand how it works. Well, it has to make sense how it might work. Then we try like to see animal studies exposing animals to the hazards, see how they fare. Then we like to see some human data to see if, if people are exposed to it, do they get it. And then we like to take all this laboratory and, and, and very controlled settings and we like to go out into the real world and see, does this situation really happen so that people can be exposed to a particular pollutant. So let's walk through radon with it, using that uh, those four criteria. Well, we've already discussed the model, how the decay products lie on the lung tissue, and they, they're close enough to the tissue that they can deliver their dose of energy and perhaps cause some damage. Okay. Now, every one that decays won't, won't necessarily cause damage, though. It has to be the one that shoots directly at the cells. If it shoots to the sides or out into the little air gap between the, the lung tissue, then it, then it won't cause any problems, won't cause any health effects. So it's only if it delivers its dose to the tissue itself, does it even have a chance of, of creating a problem? Now that's, that's the model that we have, and it makes sense. It fits with some other pollutants that we deal with, how, how they work as well. The animal studies. We've exposed uh, dogs, mice, and rats to radon, and, um, and they get lung cancer. Um, the ideal way to set that experiment up is, you know, that you get some dogs and you expose them to low levels of radon, fairly low, like people would be exposed to fairly low levels, and you expose them for oh, 60 or 70 years and see how, you know, and see if they get lung cancer. But there's a couple of problems with that. Number one, the dog's gonna die anyway before, you know, <laughs> before your research project's over, so that, that's gonna ruin it. And also nobody's going to pay you for 60 or 70 years to sit there and watch these dogs. So. Uh, the, what we do is we expose animals to large doses for shorter periods of time. Extrapolate that information to say that if they were exposed to lower amounts for longer periods of time, that would be the same. So that's, that's how we get the information from animals. Now for humans, we used miners. And we used mostly uranium miners, but we've used other miners around the world as well and that work in the soil, you know, in the ground, and are exposed to radon because of the, 
because of the amount of uh, uh, radon that gets created in the mines. And we find that it, at high levels, the, lung can the miners get lung cancer. But as we get down to lower and lower levels, it becomes more difficult to see because miners are also fairly heavy smokers. At least they were during the, during the time period that, that most of this research, research was being conducted. And so it becomes very difficult to see those lung cancers at, at, at that low levels because the smoking habits become so, so dominant. But at high levels, we do indeed see it. And we see a straight line going down until we get to an area where we just can't distinguish whether the results are meaningful anymore. So we have some human data suggesting that the, the information we have is correct. And now we say, let's go out into the real world, see if it, if it really happens. And, and we've measured homes around, uh, even around <coughs> Licking County. So we know that radon is indeed in homes where people live. So it, it can really happen. So that's the data that we have. We're, we're unsure at lower levels as far as having hard data to point at it. But I, I always like to make another caution to people saying that if you don't think that radon is a problem, then I certainly don't think you'd have much of a problem with someone bringing a low-level radioactive waste site to your area. It's the same radiation, exactly the same radiation, and it's even less. I mean, the alpha radiation that we're worried about with radon is 20 times more dangerous than the gamma or the beta radiation because it's, it has such a high energy level associated with it. It's easier to protect yourself from it, but it's more dangerous radiation. And so that's, the, that's sort of the seed I like to plant in people's minds on that issue. How does radon get into the home? We he read in the newspapers and, and see on, uh, on television, people will talk about the radon seeps into the home. And some does indeed just seep into homes, but no more seeps into the home than seeps into the air outside. So it wouldn't be any higher in your house than it is outside if it just seeped in. But our homes indeed pump radon in. And the way we do that is we use appliances in the home that exhaust air out of the house. So let's take a dryer. We take we take air from the home, usually in the basement or somewhere in the home. We take the air, we heat it, we blow it through the clothes, and we exhaust it outside. And that usually moves about 100 cubic feet of air every minute, 100 cubic feet of air per minute, and exhaust it outside. We don't have another fan outside, you know, blowing air back into the house to compensate for that. Now, when we build our houses, we do something fairly interesting. We don't just pour the concrete on the bare soil, usually. Sometimes we do. but the preferred way is to pour that on some type of aggregate, crushed rock or stone, put down first, and then pour the concrete over it. And there's a lot of air gap in that rock and stone. We like to have about four inches down there. We'll settle for two, but we like to try and have about four. And so there's a lot of air down there that's available to come into the home when the basement goes negative pressure with the soil. Or this could be on a slab on grade as easy as it's on a as with a basement or a crawl space. But when it goes negative, it gets pulled in through openings, through floor drains. The drain's trapped, but that's a piece of metal stuck in a concrete. Around the drain, it can come in. And we have this little crack that goes all the way, 16th of an inch crack maybe, that goes all the way around the perimeter where the floor meets the wall. Yeah, when you take that 16th of an inch times the perimeter of the building, that starts to become a pretty decent sized hole. Then we have sumps that can be coming in. We have electrical service. When they pass the plumbing pipe through the basement wall to bring it into the building, what's the usual rule? Four inch pipe, eight inch hole. You know, you might have to pass your hands through with the pipe, you know, to, just, to, just to get the pipe through and to, and to manage it. So there's plenty of oil for the radon to come in in the soil gas when the basement goes negative compared with the, with the soil. Now, it could come in in the water supply, but we don't have that problem in Ohio. We don't have enough radon in the water supply to, to create a problem. Uh, but it, it comes in through cracks, openings in the foundation in the soil. And certain times of the day, we, uh, a lot of these devices get operating at the same time. In other words, we come home from work, we put something on the stove, turn on the turn on the rage hood, maybe go down, take the load you put in the washer, 
you know, into the dryer, turn it on. Maybe in the winter, go get a fire started in the fireplace. Nice little roaring fire going, go up, take a shower, turn on the exhaust fan up there. And a lot of things get happening at the same time. So that's the way we find the radon levels in homes, is that they're not just one level all the time. They go up and down, and they're varying all the time. Now, in addition to the, uh, to the mechanical equipment, like fans operating, we have some other things that, that tend to make the radon come into the home. And that's simply that warm air rises. And because warm air rises, there's a little bit of a negative pressure behind that coming up. And that helps translate. That's why even if you turn on a, a, f a bathroom fan on the second floor, you can measure the negative pressure in the basement because of that that warm air rising it translates it. And that works better the more openings that you have from the basement to the highest level. Things like, you know, around the chimney, you gotta have to leave that gap around the chimney. Well, the warm air that's in the basement really can travel up that, up that chute very easily, unencumbered. And so things like that tend to have a lot of, this is called stack effect, because it moves up a stack just like a chimney stack, because the warm air rises is what makes the stuff go up a chimney. And some homes of different design can be different. If you have an open staircase, maybe from the basement all the way up to the second floor, or even from the first to a third floor, then this, this can, make, can accentuate what the stack effect does. And last also deals with, uh, with the mechanical equipment, too, in that when we heat air or cool it, we're very careful with that duct work. We keep that sealed because we want that warm or cool air delivered exactly where we want it. You know, we don't want to lose that conditioned air because we, we just have to condition more to make up for it. But what do we use for a return duct? We'll go down there and we'll nail a piece of sheet metal across two floor joists and let it come back through that. They're very leaky. Well, that's the negative side of the fan. Remember, the fan takes the air and pushes it up through the house, pulls it back through negative pressure there, and those leaky return ducts go through the basement and they help create negative pressure too. Makes more positive pressure upstairs and more negative downstairs. So that's how the radon gets pulled in. If we were going to mine radon, the way we, what we'd do is we'd go cover the surface of the ground, and we'd stick a hole down inside of it that, that had openings in it, and we'd exhaust air out, and we'd be pulling as much radon as we could get out of the soil. And that's pretty much what the way a house works for what comes out of the soil. Now, we talked about four as being a level of concern, four picocuries per liter. Now in the soil, I haven't measured in Licking County, but my guess is that you have more radon in the soil over here than we do in Columbus because you have higher levels of radon over here than we have in Columbus. But in Columbus, just about any place I stick a probe in the ground and measure how much radon's in the ground, there's about 4,000 picocuries per liter in the soil. So there's a lot of it in the soil. And that comes from uh, mostly from the shale and also comes from, uh, from the, the clay layers as well. So the radon is definitely available in the soil. It's just a matter of how much comes in from it. Then it's the characteristics of the house and whether it draws radon in that creates this situation. And I've seen this in, uh, in Columbus several times. A house has 100 picocuries per liter and the one next to it just has barely over one. So just because this guy's got a problem, you definitely don't want to go screaming into the street if you live in the blue house. You just want to test and find out maybe I've got a problem, maybe I don't. And likewise, if my neighbor has a very low level, that doesn't mean that I necessarily don't have a high level. And it seems terribly wasteful, and I suppose it is, to test every home just to find the high ones. But I don't know of any other way to do it. If we knew what the high homes were to start with, we wouldn't have to test at all. We could just fix them. But unless you test every home, there's no way to know which homes have high levels of radon and which ones have low levels of radon. Uh, US Public Health Service has issued a, a national radon health advisory to uh, alert the public to uh, elevated radon levels and that they can be corrected. 
These are some testing devices that are to be used. Um, these are some longer term and these are shorter term detectors. But let's take a look at the kind you'll get. Your package will look a little bit different from this, but it'll be the same shape and probably from the back it'll look the same. And we'll take it out and there'll be three things in there. There'll be this radon detector, there'll be a little uh, something that'll fold up into a cardboard airplane, and there'll be some instructions in there as well. But since I'm a man, I already threw the instructions away, because I won't, I won't read them anyway. So, <laughs> no, you should follow the instructions carefully. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I encourage you, that even though you've seen it done here, read the instructions before you put it out. I don't think you'll be confused by them at all, and it'll make things much clearer. But I, I want to caution you, once you tear the bag open, you're starting to measure. Okay, so, and the instructions are cleverly put inside the bag. So you can't like read the instructions before they start. You sort of have to read the instructions as you start. So there are some summary instructions on the, on the back of, where to, of what, what to do with it. But when you open the packet, there'll be a place to put your name and address at the top, okay, and you'll fill that in, and then you'll circle the day of the month and the time that you started. You don't have to circle the month because you're not going to leave them out that long for that to be a minute, but the day of the month and the time, that's to the nearest hour that you start. Then you put the wedge in and you place it and you leave it from four to seven days. Not less than four and not longer than seven. And then when the test is done, on your way to the post office, you pick it up, you take the wedge out and throw it away, seal up the packet, it just seals itself shut. You move the strip and it, it seals shut. Mark the day and the time you stopped the test. And then it's it's already postage paid. Everything's ready to go. Just put it in the nearest mailbox and let it get there. Now, it, remember, it's radon is radioactive and has a half-life of about four days, which means every four days, half of it's gone. So after 12 days, they won't even measure it because half was gone in four days. Another four days, you've only got 25%. Another half went away. And then, you know, you're down to only 12% left after 12 days. And, they'll, and then they'll be able to analyze it at the laboratory and tell you how much radon you had. And they'll send it back to you. And the, the summary results will come back to us as well. But we won't have, we, we may have the names associated with those this time. But. And also, it won't just come just a number in the mail. You know, you won't open a letter that'll say six on it or anything. It'll have some information that'll tell you what that means. What should I do with levels like that? Now, where would I put the detector in the home? Well, EPA recommends that you put it in the lowest lived-in level of the home. And they define lived-in as a level that um, you actually spend some time in. Now, that means different things to different people. Because I'll talk to uh, one person and they'll say, oh, no, I don't want to put it in the basement. I just spend a couple of hours down there every day, you know, folding laundry or, 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 or messing with the laundry and that. And you'll talk to someone else and say, I want to put it in the basement because I spend a couple of hours down there every day in my workshop. And you get the same argument for both sides of, of the interpretation. But I would say if you're spending some time in the basement test there, that will be the most conservative. It'll let you know if there's radon in the house to start with. Then the levels upstairs frequently are lower than they are in the basement. So after the first test, uh, we'll, we will recommend, if that's high, that you test more. We don't want to do anything based on just one test. We want to get as many, as many tests as we can to convince ourselves that, that it indeed is, is a problem. So we'll run the first test and put it in the lowest level of the home that you actually spend some time. Now, if you've got a dirt floor basement, I wouldn't bother putting it down there. It's going to be high down there, but you're not going to be spending that much time down in a, in a basement that has a dirt floor. So we'll put it on the lowest lived-in level of the home. We want it at least 20 inches off the floor 
keep it about two feet off the floor because we know they're close, the radon level is higher closer to the floor. That's where it's coming in is from the, through the ground. We try not to put it on an outside wall, just somewhere in the middle of a room. And, but we want to avoid a couple of things. We want to avoid putting it like over a sump pump, something like that, where radon might be coming in right across it because that can be misleading. But just somewhere in the middle of the room, set it on a chair, pull a chair out of the room, set it on the, the seat of a chair, and then just leave it alone. A couple of rooms we want to avoid are like the laundry room and the kitchen. That's because not only does radon absorb onto this charcoal, but water does too. And if we get too much water around, the water wins. It wins the race to get there. So. And we'll just be measuring how much water you have in your house and not how much radon you have in your house. And that's really how simple it is to put it down. Four to seven days, lowest lived in level of the home, <coughs> 20 inches off the ground, somewhere near uh, the middle of the room. And then send those results off. Send the results off as quickly as you can. Very important that that gets back to the laboratory quickly. And that's how the results will come back. Now, what are the results going to mean? If your levels are less than four, EPA's guidance recommend, they don't recommend any action right away. You might want to test again in a couple of years. Characteristics of the house, you know, another five years the house might be, have different characteristics. You know, uh, when you think of soil conditions around your home, people will think, I don't have a radon problem, I've got wet clay around my home. Well, maybe the wet clay keeps it out. Maybe the wet clay is the source to start with, which might mean you have a problem. But even if there is wet clay that, that's keeping the radon out, what happens during a drought? That dries and cracks. And it goes from being the least permeable soil to being the most permeable soil when there's large crack, cracks in it. So from time to time, situations can change. And so uh, we recommend testing periodically. Now, from 4 to 20 picocuries per liter in that range, we recommend that you retest over a year's time. You, take, you can take short-term measurements like we would do here in each of the seasons and average them together. And I would put one back, I would do more than one test at a time as well. I'd put one in the lowest level and I'd put one in a level where we really spend most of the time. And I would average those together to get a number. See what, see what the exposure is, your average exposure to it. And then over the seasons, you can see whether, over a year's time, am I being exposed to more than four picocuries per liter. Now, from 20 to 200 picocuries per liter, we recommend that you do the follow-up testing over a few months' time. The levels are higher. If they are indeed prove out to be high, you might want to get something done a little quicker. And above 200 picocuries per liter, we recommend that you do some follow-up right away. And you here in Licking County have some levels above 200 picocuries per liter. A lot of places in the country where I talk, they, they don't have levels like that around here. But, but you do have some levels in, in Licking County above 200 picocuries per liter. So you want to be aware of those. Now, that's what we recommend you do. You do the follow-up as quickly as possible above 200 and the, and the other criteria below. Now, if my follow-up measurements come up high, then we sort of use the same categories. If the follow-up measurements show that it's below four, you might not want to do anything at all. Okay, you want to, uh, might want to test again in a few years, just like the other recommendation was. If it's from four to 20 picocuries per liter, they recommend that you do something, have abatement done, have the level in the home reduced within the next few years. Okay. It's not something that has to be done immediately. We're looking at a lifetime exposure, so we're trying to get these levels down at some time, sometime in the future. If they're between 20 and 200, recommend that you take care of the, get the radon levels down within the next few months. Again, the higher the level, the more, you know, the more urgent you would want to be about that. And above 200, they recommend you do something right away to get the radon level down. Uh, it's pretty important to get those levels down immediately if they're above 200 picocuries per liter. 
And that's the recommendation on testing and what, what will be created. Now, there's several ways to the, that someone will approach mitigation if you would indeed have high levels of radon in the home. They can try and prevent the radon from coming in by sealing the cracks and openings to the soil, but that's real hard to do. You know, if you've ever taken a sieve in the kitchen and you pour water, it just goes right through it. And then take it and try and cover up as many holes as you can on it. You can probably get about three quarters of the holes covered up with your hands and arms. And then have somebody pour water through it. It goes through just as fast. It goes through the holes, it goes through the fewer holes that they have there faster. And so that's what will happen. As you seal up areas, then other areas will, will simply be, a, be another source. So it's very difficult to get it with sealing alone. But sealing helps all the other systems that are out there. And the other is to ventilate. But by that, we're talking about sub-slab ventilation. I think we've got a, a, a diagram of that shortly. And you can use natural or forced ventilation. In other words, blow air into the house. That can be a little expensive and uncomfortable you know, through January and February, though, if you have to move too much air into the house to get the radon levels down. So yes, this is a, this is a typical mitigation system maybe more holes in the floor than we might usually see. But what they're doing is, remember that gravel layer that's down below the floor that was higher pressure than the, than the basement? That's why the radon came in. Now they're going to drop a pipe down there and connect it to a fan that moves air out of there. And we're just trying to move enough air to drop the pressure down below the floor to below what it is in the basement. Now the air doesn't, if we get the pressure below the floor lower than what it is in the basement, the air doesn't flow from the basement up anymore. It flows from the basement down. And we try and minimize that too because that's conditioned air and we don't want to lose any more than that when we have to. But that's what we'll do. And they'll make as many penetrations as they need in the floor to get that evenly distributed, the pressure evenly distributed around the floor. Sometimes there's just gravel around the edges and you drill a hole in the middle of the floor and there's no gravel there at all. Now, the guy didn't actually rake it around like he should have, is what's happened there, but I can't imagine that. And uh, so they might take more suction points than that. Also, there might be, in, in Columbus, the typical house construction is a basement and two crawl spaces off of that. And so if there's a crawl space, that's hard, because there's usually not, usually not some concrete to drop a pipe down through to get suction under. So what they do is put a membrane down, some, some six, somewhere between 6 and 12 mil plastic down over the surface and use a spray adhesive to seal it to the walls and then pull suction in the ground under that membrane, under the plastic. And if you don't think much soil air comes into the home, try sealing a crawl space. It, it really drives it home. You know, you'll have a crawl space will be all about that high and crawling around there, getting the plastic sealed, and you'll get down to the last edge towards the hole. Hopefully you've done it that way, so you're right by the hole to get out of the crawl space. And as you start to seal that, that plastic will lift all the way up to the rafters. That much air is moving in from the soil and fill that space. Just, it's just very difficult to believe that that much air comes in through the soil into the home, but it does. And then this is connected and the fan runs all the time. It'll probably be something like a 70 watt, 75 watt fan will operate continuously, continuously trying to keep this pressure field different from what it is. You know, pressure lower in the soil than it is in the, uh, in the basement. And so there's going to be a cost associated. It would be like running a 75 watt for all the time. And they will have an ID with a photo on it. It'll have their name and their ID number on it. And they should present that with you, present that to you, whenever they're giving you a bid or, or giving you any information. And indeed, when you call somebody and they show up to talk about radon mitigation, that's the first thing you want to see. Do you have it? And is it current? There's an expiration date right there on it. So to see if they've kept themselves current. Usually, that's not a problem, but uh, just for instance, we had, a, we had a big change in the way things were recommended to be done last October. And um, virtually everybody's had to have some type of retraining since last October to, to understand what the current guidelines are and the way they're expected to do work now. Radon in schools. 
you definitely have had some publicity, publicity here with radon in Heath schools. Um, we have some as bad over in Columbus. We just didn't get the publicity. Lucky you, huh? Yeah. So <laughs> uh, there's a lot of, of, of schools around the country that have a problem. 19% of the nation's public schools have a radon problem in at least one room. And it's real silly. It sounds like 19% of the school buildings is a problem, but some of them is just in one or two rooms. And it's just silly not to find out what it is and just say, make that the storeroom and, and hold classes somewhere else. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't cost a lot of money to do something like that. But it, it, I think it's important to find this out. And uh, of course, the, the schools are quite reluctant to do so. They've, they lost a lot of money, wasted a lot of money on asbestos. And then um, they're concerned that they're going to do the same thing with radon. And I, and I can sympathize with them on that issue as well. OK, and the EPA's advice is test now and be sure. And uh, this is the, their new ad campaign that they, they came up with last October. And it's, uh, so what are you doing this weekend that's so important you can't test for radon? Is sort of the, uh, the motto there. And these were some levels of radon that EPA found in their initial survey of Franklin County. Um, this was, I believe, four years ago. Maybe it's five years ago now. I should have put the date on there. They only tested 29 homes. The highest level was almost 30, 28.9. The average level was 8. And 72% of the homes were greater than 4 picocuries per liter. And 31% were greater than 10 picocuries per liter. You know, when I talked about the, the, the association between radon and, uh, and lung cancer starts to fall off when it gets to lower levels, well, 10 is where it starts to fall off. At 10, you can pretty clearly see a link. And 31% of the homes above 10. So these are the, these are the data from, uh, from Licking County. And I think the advice we have is that, uh, you know, just as the slide earlier said, test now and be sure whether you have a radon problem or not. 